morning. Um, when my dad asked me to fill in, um, first of all, I'm very humbled and blessed to be asked back again, um, for those of you who were here last time. Um, but he had an idea for me to preach on Ezra. And I don't know about you guys, but um, as I heard that, I was like, I got to really think because I didn't remember. I was like, Ezra is not a book I've spent a lot of time on. It's usually one of those books that you kind of know it's in the Old Testament, but you don't, you can't really maybe recall exactly what's all in it. And so as I started to kind of dive into it, um, it was really, really cool. It was exciting to see. And so what I want to kind of do today is paint you guys a picture of what's going on. And so I'm going to jump around a lot. I'm going to try to go slow. I'm very guilty of going very fast. Um, And so I'm going to try to just paint this picture and give you the background of it because I think it adds so much beauty and power to the promise uh, as it flows into the New Testament. And so if you will turn with me to Ezra chapter 3, we are going to be reading verses 8 through 13. Ezra chapter 3. Starting in verse 8, uh, it's titled Rebuilding the Temple. Now in the second year, after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, and Jeshua, the son of Jezodak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites, the 20-year-old and upward, to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his, and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Hanadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord, according to the direction of David, king of Israel." And when they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from far away. So this story, to give it some context, um, it kind of begins, it goes all the way back to King David. We, We hear so much about King David all throughout the scripture, and he's described as a man after God's own heart, right? If you look at his life objectively, That doesn't make a lot of sense to us a lot of times because his life is filled with a lot of different sins. His family life is very broken. Uh, There's a lot of brokenness in his life. But usually the reason that he's pointed to, uh, even after he's passed away, he's pointed to as a man after God in heart. It points more towards this this special and the specific relationship that he has with God. All throughout the Psalms, if you read through the Psalms and the story and the life of David, there's this yearning for a deep presence with God. He has, he has this deep yearning. It starts with this dream, this prayer that he has to God. And he asks for God to come and dwell among his people, right? He asks for them to be able to build this place, this house for the Lord, where he can dwell among his people, right? And we see this manifest through his son, Solomon, who builds this temple, this beautiful temple. You can read through it. It gives this beautiful picture, these dimensions uh, of this house where God would come and dwell. And in 1 Kings, we see after they finish building the temple, They finish the Holy of Holies and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies. And as the Levites are going through the service, uh, they're they're ministering, they're preaching, this cloud descends on the house of the Lord and it fills the entire temple. So much so that they can't finish the service. Is that much power and that much awe there and people are filled with fear and with praise. And so this beautiful picture of this, this culmination of God dwelling among his people in the house of the Lord. Um, And then over time, we see Israel's sin and complacency, right? They have, they've been given this gift. They have this gift of God's presence among his people, this place where they can go and they can worship and they can be with God. But they continue to choose and to fall into sin um, and to fall and to become complacent with this gift that they've received. Um, And eventually we see that Israel loses this gift, this gift of God's presence and of his protection. Uh, it, It says that, As Israel's sin grew and grew, 
God's presence left through the, it says through the east gate of the temple. His presence leaves the temple um, and that presence and that protection that God had promised and given to Israel had now left because of their sin. Uh, And then in the midst of this, in the midst of all their sin, we still see this promise for God's restoration. So even though Israel had turned their back and rejected God and they continued to sin, we see even before they were exiled, before he left, God had this, this, these promises, this plan in place to restore his people, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. And then the last thing we want to focus on, and again, this is just, I want to kind of give you guys a picture um, because at the very end, I want to focus on, we see two different responses at the end of this portion. And I think those are really, really important. But uh, I want to begin kind of with Israel's sin. Um, So if you will, again, I have a couple different spots, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I will do my best to go slow, but these different uh, portions of scripture that I kind of want to jump to, I think just, again, kind of add to that picture um, of what's kind of going on here. So Jeremiah 25, um, starting in verse four. Um, If you know anything about Jeremiah, he's the last prophet that was sent to Israel before the exile. And so if you look at his life, it's a little depressing. Uh, he was called to a life of ministry um, and he, he pleaded and begged the people of Israel to turn back to God. Um, and I think it says only one or two people really ever listened to him in his whole life. And so uh, he was called to this kind of this suffering servant uh, to call people back. But he writes this in Jeremiah 25, uh, again, starting in verse four, going through 11. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear although the Lord persistently sent to you all of his servants, the prophets saying, turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds and dwell upon the land the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish them from the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So it says this, God sends prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, chance after chance. He pleads with them to turn back to him. To, to embrace his presence and worship him and to humble themselves before them. Obviously, this doesn't happen. Uh, we see this highlighted if you've read through the books of Kings or Judges. Um, I remember studying this in Bible school. My professor described it as a toilet bowl. Uh, so if you flush it, it's just this downward spiral, this plunging into more and more sin for the people of Israel. But even in the midst of their sin, in the midst of this downward spiral and this rejection and this complacency towards God, we see kind of two theme promises all throughout the Bible. Um, And we're gonna just talk about two of the portions of scripture. But we see two of them. We see a promise for a messianic king, a Messiah that would come and save them. We also see a promise of his presence. So these two theme promises uh, in the midst of their sin. Uh, So this messianic king, this Messiah that would come, he talks about it in Isaiah chapter 11, verses one through four. And Isaiah, uh, he writes this long before the exile. So again, we see this intentionality, this specific promise laid out before any of this ever happens, before their sin, before, uh, probably in the midst of their sin, but before their exile. Um, And it goes all the way back to Genesis. Um, But in Isaiah 11, starting in verse one, it says, therefore shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eye sees or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked." Excuse me. 
So again, we talked about this promise extends all the way back to Genesis, right? Right after the fall, he promises a Messiah, someone to come and save us from our sins. Um, And then all throughout too, we see um, at the end of Genesis, when Jacob is blessing his sons right before his death, he says, "The, the scepter of rule shall not depart from the line of Judah, right? Foreshadowing Jesus to come from the line of Judah. And so again, there's a lot of scripture and there's a lot of different spots. But again, the the big picture of that is just this intentionality all throughout from the first book of the Bible to the end, the intentionality of God to restore and to save his people in the midst of their sin. Um, And then the second promise of God's presence. So we see this promise of a Messiah, right? He would send his son. We know the end of that story, but for them, it was this picture of a messianic king, someone who would come and restore Israel, who would save them. Uh, God's presence is the second promise. And that we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 43. So in Ezekiel, just to paint the picture, Ezekiel uh, is a prophet during the exile. So in the midst of this exile, while they're in Babylon, um, Ezekiel wrote a lot and spoke to the people a lot to reassure them of God's promises in the midst of their exile and that God would restore them and redeem them. So in chapter 43, verses four through five, um, and and again, most of his, his writing Specifically, there's nine chapters dedicated to the specific dimensions. He basically, God gave them a blueprint for what the second temple would look like when they would return home. And so just the the specific nature of this promise where God said, not only am I gonna bring you back, I will show you exactly how to restore this temple. uh, And I will also point towards this Messiah, this messianic king that would come in the long term as well. So verses four and five, as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east, the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So this would be so significant for the people of Israel because again, pointing back to when the presence of God left, he left through the East gate. So that imagery and that picture of God returning from the same direction would be so significant to the people of Israel at that time. And just the significance of that return of God to his temple, to his place and his presence filling the temple. This picture and this image, especially of the people that knew and were there for the first temple, this would be such a a prominent image and a promise of reassurance for them. Um, And then we we fast forward a little bit. um, And this this promise is then connected to that same promise of the Messianic King. In Zechariah chapter two, it describes, it's the same vision. It's this vision received and it's this man and he's measuring the walls and the limits of Jerusalem. And he says that the walls of Jerusalem will not be able to inhabit the people of Israel uh, and the cho- his chosen people because they will extend to all nations, right? So again, it's now connecting this return, this restoration of the temple and God's presence it is now connecting this to this promise of a Messiah. And it says, God's presence will dwell among you, among the many nations, the people that return to God. And so not only is he talking about this short term, right, the return to this promised land, the physical country of Israel, but he's talking about the messianic king that was to come and he would extend the walls. He would include all nations in this promise of restoration and presence and dwelling among them. Um, And we see this also connected uh, in Ephesians chapter two. So to bring in the New Testament, right, uh, he promises his presence among us, this messianic promise, because now It's not about the four walls. It's not about the temple. It's not about any of that. It describes us as this new temple. So in Ephesians 2, um, and again, a background here, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesians, and he's talking about the church. He's talking about God's desire for the church. And so he writes, uh, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, talking about the Messiah coming and including all nations, Uh, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, right? All the prophets and the people that God had sent to guide the people. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit. So not only, again, are we seeing this promise of a physical restoration of a building, we're seeing this this fast forward, this promise to come where it wasn't about a building. It wasn't about having to be in this place where God would dwell. God would dwell among us. And we know that Jesus would come and tear that curtain, tear that separation between us and God's presence. And he would dwell within us through the spirit. So it's this beautiful culmination of this picture. It's like not only the short-term, 
this short-term reassurance, but this long-term, something to look forward to, something that would give them hope in the future as well. Um, so the last part, this last part I want to focus on is the response to God's presence, right? Uh, I'm going to read verses 11 through 13 one more time from Ezra. We see these two different responses. Just listen to uh, kind of the distinction between the two here. So verse 11, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites, the heads of father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice. When they saw the foundation of his house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from far away. So you kind of have these two different groups, right? Uh, you have these people that are weeping and grieving. And it describes them as this older generation, right? The people that had seen the first temple. When they had seen, they had probably witnessed the beauty of the Solomon's temple. It's described, right? That cloud comes and that presence and that dwelling and just that, that awe and that power. And they see this new temple and they, they it, it, you know, it doesn't say specifically why they weep or why they grieve, but I would imagine a lot of it has to do with their expectation. They realized it would never be the same as the first one. Maybe it didn't look the way they thought it would look. Um, maybe it didn't manifest itself. God's presence didn't show itself like it did the first time. And so you see this weeping and this grieving from this older generation. And then you have this other group. Um, it doesn't specify if they're younger or not, but I would imagine a lot of them were younger. They probably didn't know what the first temple looked like. All they knew was exile and that what they were seeing is it says that they were filled with joy because they were witnessing the fulfillment of that promise of restoration uh, and that promise that God would restore them and bring them back to Israel and build this second temple and his presence would dwell. That's all they knew, right? So you have these two different responses. What are our expectations for restoration? It's okay to grieve. I wanna, I wanna be very clear on that because um, the reality of life, as most of you probably know very well, is you will go through and experience brokenness in life whether it's a result of sin, whether it's a result of other people's choices, whatever it is, you'll experience brokenness in life. And it's okay to grieve that. But what's next? What comes after that? Do we stay in that grief? Do we stay in that self-pity? Um, we are the dwelling place of God. So again, the reason I jumped around all like that, and that was probably a lot, so forgive me for that, but just that connection of God's restoration of his people to Israel in that second temple but then also this promise that is so much, means so much more is that messianic, that Messiah King that would come and would take away that separation and God would dwell in us. Do we understand that that is the same power? So this imagery of God's coming as a cloud in the first temple and dwelling as a cloud and filling the temple that every, you couldn't, they couldn't even finish the service because of, of, of God's presence, right? The same God that orchestrated the promise and the restoration of these people out of Babylon and brought them back home, rebuilt this temple, provided all of the material, all of the funding, and he rebuilt this temple and he filled this presence, this place where God, where people could come and God's presence would be there in the second temple. The same God who orchestrated from the line of Judah all the way down to Jesus coming and becoming that messianic king, that Messiah that would free his people from their sin uh, and would come and restore and bring in all nations to, to Israel to be his children. That same power dwells within us. Do we recognize that? And what are our expectations of God's presence? Do we recognize God's presence? Did we come here today expecting God to be present and to move? Because we know because of these promises, because of Jesus coming and tearing down that separation, the walls here have nothing to do. The church is not that. It's you, it's me, it's every single person sitting in the pew. God's presence through the spirit is within each one of you. You are the church. It has nothing to do with the buildings here. It has nothing to do with uh, the work that contractors put in all those years ago, right? God's presence is within us. Do we recognize it? And what, how do we see it? Do we want it to look a certain way? Or did we come today to church to, expend, to expect his presence? and to expect him to move, right? We read through the response of reading, we hear his word. Do we recognize the presence in that? 
right? Or are we just saying the words? Do we come and do we recognize that? Uh, And what are our expectations for God's restoration? Maybe you're going through some brokenness right now. Maybe you've been through some. You'll probably face some in the future if you haven't. That's just the reality. I hate to say it that way. What are our expectations for God's restoration? Is it his timing or is it our timing? Do we want, do we have an expectation of what his restoration should look like? Or do we trust and humble ourselves before him and just receive his restoration? Because what I think, uh, this picture of these two different responses, this weeping and this grieving, is there's, you know, and it doesn't say exactly why. But I would imagine a lot of these people, they just wanted to see that first temple. Their expectation was what they knew, what was familiar to them. They wanted that same thing, but they knew it would never be the same. But they were missing the point of that messianic promise of what was to come. Because Jesus coming down and tearing that separation is so much greater than any building that you could ever build. So much greater than any temple you could ever have. The presence of God is dwelling within each one of us. We are his temple. We are that temple. Can we humble ourselves before a powerful and loving God and move from grieving our expectations and move to a posture of trust and praise, trusting that he wants the best for us and that he is orchestrating everything before any of these things happen. He chose you before you were ever born, before you were ever formed, he chose you. It has nothing to do with what we've done. It has nothing to do with what you will do. He chose you before you were born. There's nothing you can do before you're born to impress anybody. He chose you. Can we move and can we trust in God for his presence and for his restoration in our life? Verse 11, I wanna end with this. Verse 11 again, thinking of the people that were filled with joy. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel, towards all people, towards all nations, because Jesus has brought them into the people of Israel to be his children. Can we recognize that today and can we rest in that and trust that?